produced many times, but this fellow takes the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, You've been so gracious, so generous. Uh, I feel very, very privileged, very honored uh, to have had this invitation to speak. I want to thank uh, Ty Boston for doing me the honor. I have very high regard for Ty. I have spoken in the past in Ty. I have done a little bit of work also for Ty in uh, India. It's a great organization. And I was very happy to see what Ty Boston is uh, uh, doing here. Uh, I actually was thinking about uh, uh, the topic which uh, might be appropriate uh, for this audience. And then I thought uh, that uh, <coughs> let me talk about something that I've been very passionate about during the last uh, few years, uh, simply <coughs> because of the fact that in order to create a better world, and better world for everyone, not for just a selected few, uh, there's only one mantra that is going to work, which is going to be more from less for many. So I thought, uh, my own thoughts on this subject is something that I might uh, I want to project uh, uh, before you. Uh, we are going to talk about innovation. Innovation is becoming a buzzword. And if I look at it uh, simply, what uh, innovation does is uh, that through innovation we achieve more from less. As simple as that. The mainframe computer used to occupy the size of this room and today we carry so much power uh, in our pocket. That's all possible because of innovation. To do things which occupy less space, takes uh, less money, uh, uh, takes uh, less time, makes you competitive, uh, makes a better world all the time. However, uh, this has to be also ensured that it is done for uh, more and more, one would say profit, no, but I would say also for people, okay? Now, if you look at uh, the industrial enterprises, what they try to do? They're always trying to get uh, more performance by using less, let's say, human resource, financial capital, uh, physical capital, what have you, right? But the ultimate objective is to get more profit, more value to the shareholder. EBITDA, profit before tax, profit after tax, I mean these are very familiar words, isn't it? That's what uh, enterprise is trying to do. On the other hand, the issue about uh, innovation that is truly inclusive, which is not just for select uh, few people who are the haves, but also for the have-nots, which I term as inclusive innovation, is getting more from less for many, many people. And what do I mean by many people? We are always looking for value for money, isn't it, in everything that we do. <coughs> However, can we also create value for many while we are looking for value for money in our products, in our services, and so on and so forth. For these <coughs> 10 millions uh, who are the have -nots. Many of them don't have access to education, they don't have access to health, they don't have access to sanitation, water, things that we take for granted. How, how do we create uh, uh, that value? That is the big challenge before the world, isn't it? Now, when I talk about many people, what am I talking about? I'm talking about four billion people whose income levels is less than two dollars per day. And what do they need then? Because the income levels are so low. They don't need low cost, but they need ultra low cost. They don't need uh, affordability, they need extreme affordability. <coughs> what do I mean by that? For example, you're poor, you have HIV AIDS, and you want ARVs, the entire retrovirus, okay? And your treatment costs you, uh, I mean, uh, costs you something like $10,000. Now you cannot say because you're poor, 10% less for you, $9,000. <laughs> you don't have that. You cannot even say 10 times less because he doesn't have $1,000. It has to be 100 times less. 
That's what I mean by ultra low cost. That's what I mean by extreme affordability. All right. So that's a big challenge. How do you uh, then go from incremental innovation to disruptive innovation? Because when you talk about 10% less, you are talking about incremental, isn't it? But when you are talking about 10 times less, you have to do something disruptive, do something completely uh, uh, different. Let me give you an example by what I mean by extreme affordability. This gentleman up here, very unfortunate, he has lost his legs, but he has a very, very sophisticated uh, uh, pair of artificial fit, and uh, it costs twenty thousand dollars because it has sensors, these, that, and the other, and so on and so forth. Now, can uh, uh, these people, whose income levels are less than two dollars a day, affect? I mean, afford? No, obviously not. Just divide twenty thousand dollars by two dollars per day, and you can imagine if you take ten thousand dollars of their income or ten thousand days of their income. Isn't it? So therefore, what do we do? Uh, we then look at uh, something like uh, a twenty-eight dollar food. Uh, it appeared uh, on the uh, cover page of Time. Uh, it says the global scourge of landmines left thousands limbless, and then two gifted Indians developed twenty-eight dollar food. This is the general food. Is now, the beauty about that food is that it has to work in India. It has to work for Indians. Now, what do Indians do? They squat. What do Indians do? Poor Indians, they walk barefoot. What do poor Indians do? They sit, I mean, stand in the paddy field throughout the day. What do Indians do? They climb on the tree. And what do they do? They jump. So the kind of... Uh, 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 sort of uh, function that food has to perform is 10 times more demanding, 100 times more demanding than the gentleman that you saw will have. So you have a challenge of giving so in something like $28, uh, 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 let's say performance, which is 10 times better, which is 100 times better. So here is an equation that you are talking about creating a foot which is, let's say, 100,000 times uh, cheaper, but at the same time, whose performance is uh, 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 10 times better. All right, that is getting more from less. Not less from less, because you are having printed. So this uh, is a, a challenge, I would say, of uh, 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 more from less for more, and just see how this is made. This is Jeb foot. And you just see what it does. And now you just see what it does. Normally, I get a clap here, by the way. <laughs> right. Now, let me ask you a question. You saw him run a kilometer in 4 minutes 30 seconds. How many of you? can run a <laughs> kilometer in four minutes. Please raise your hands, I'm very serious. Anyone? What does it mean? There's a symbolism in this film. This man, without that $28 food, would have been crawling, right? And with that $28 fee, food, he's able to beat all of you. What is the symbolism? The foot is incidental, by the way. It could be an ultra low cost diagnostics which tells him why he has the fever that he has, which saves him, saves his family. 
which could be an ultra low cost therapeutics which cures you it could be an ultra low cost vaccine which makes sure that he and his family is safe all right the food is symbolic and that tells us why one talks about ultra low cost and extremely affordable so as to say now can we have this type of innovation which is inclusive innovation truly inclusive then we are talking about 4 billion people who are less than 2 dollars a day <coughs> i also believe that countries societies which will be able to let us say create such products they will have a win win situation why <coughs> if you can imagine this particular food why should only indians be using it there are 17 countries today who actually use it because it is performing so as to say such an outstanding function so therefore anyone who produces this uh, let's say an industrial enterprise uh, there will be an industrial competitiveness creating very high performance products at very low cost but at the same time increase quality of uh, the life of the poor and that is why inclusive innovation becomes so important for the whole world i happen to chair uh, the indian institute of health management research in jaipur and we have done a recent study on the use of this food by the people and what difference it has made to their lives their social standing their levels of income and the welfare of their family and it's absolutely incredible right so what you are doing by doing such inclusive innovation is really uh, changing their life forever india has always had this challenge of uh, uh, doing inclusive innovation for a period of time and why because we have had number of challenges the first is poverty still a very large fraction <laughs> of india is poor second a big diversity race religion culture third scarcity of resources and fourth of course the scale because uh, to be effective uh, you have uh, uh, to reach out to such large number of uh, people because you can't just help 10000 people and say well we have solved the problem no sorry that number has to be hundreds of uh, uh, millions now if you look at the drivers of inclusive innovation in india uh, 70% of indian population is poor lives in rural india indian farms have historically understood that only catering to the rich will limit their market share because uh, that top of the pyramid has such a small number so as to say so how do you straddle the pyramid so as to say they have to find ways to straddle the economic uh, pyramid and therefore their focus was always changing the price performance equation all the time this was the challenge with the enterprises if you continue with that as a result of this as i was just mentioning when you have scarcity on one hand and aspiration on another hand it's a terrific combination <laughs> for innovation all right and then you said i'm going to deliver it against all odds and there were a number of audacious uh, let's say uh, uh, entrepreneurs who said yes we'll meet that challenge they challenged the received wisdom and built new way of doing business and the combination of constraints and ambition as i said provided the right mix for innovation and let me explain how this happens you look at uh, this curve very carefully i mean this plot very carefully uh, you have on sorry uh, you have on uh, the x axis the price and uh, you have on the y axis the performance now obviously when the price is high the performance is high no issue you know you are able to pay the money you can get the performance you can't pay the price they have not and they will have low performance okay i mean you, you can buy only products with low performance for example if you look at personal transport uh because you have money you can buy a mercedes no issue high price high performance but you don't have money then what do you do you ride on a bicycle all right that's all that you can afford and if you look at the picture very carefully what do you find the gentleman is not only riding the bicycle 
carrying his own weight, but also carrying some other weight. And that weight is the one which gives him livelihood. All right? But poor don't remain poor. They become lower middle class. And when they become lower middle class, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> they have a scooter. But then they have to carry their entire family on that uh, scooter. All right? Still it is low price, low performance. Now, we all see this, but there was one gentleman who saw this, Radhan Tata. He personally told me this story in Bombay House that as he was driving, and he drives himself, by the way. No chauffeur drives him. He saw a family like this getting drenched with the infant, you know, uh, on the lap of uh, the mother, <laughs> pouring rains. And he said, come on, this is not that. They must have the safety, they must have the comfort that all of us enjoy. And he conceived nano, one lakh car. People said, I mean, that was ridiculous. So he, they said, it cannot be done, so as to say. But he delivered it. He delivered it, and uh, this car, which he launched, Tata Nano, uh, a couple of years ago, actually came into being. There's a very interesting definition of an innovator. They say innovator is one who does not know that it cannot be done. Ratan was that. But there's also another interesting definition. Innovator is one who sees what everyone else sees, but thinks of what nobody else thinks. We all were driving. We all saw these people getting drenched. But we never thought that you could create a car for right? And that was created. And what was the actual fit? Uh, you find the Model T was around $20,000. I'm talking in terms of normalized, uh, normalized uh, uh, money, by the way. So Beetle was uh, 11000 Mini was 11000 and Nano came for $2,000. So it was kind of 10 times uh, cheaper, so as to say. There's a book, by the way, on making of Nano already, uh, which actually tells you the entire story on how that innovation was done. Uh, you cannot believe it, but it has 46 patterns, by the way. Because the kind of unusual ideas that they had to borrow from uh, different, <coughs> uh, different sectors, for example, the seats, some ideas from helicopter, for example, were, uh, were taken. It was uh, really a co-creation because their suppliers, their vendors, actually coming in, giving them a sort of ideas. The price performance envelopes is such that $2,000 cannot be exceeded, all right? So not two wipers, one wiper. <laughs> and I remember this classic story uh, from uh, uh, the young man who led the team as to how Ratan himself participated in designing that uh, wiper, so as to say, all right? So it's an incredible story of uh, frugal uh, engineering. And I can assure you, a six-footer like me has space in the front and space at the back, so as to say. 25 kilometer per liter, uh, Euro 4 uh, uh, standards, uh, safety standards made, uh, of, 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 and the net result is basically this aspiration of these families getting people. They're getting, having the dignity and the safety and the uh, comfort, so as to say, that they reflect. So this is truly inclusive innovation. I, I, I have to say, <coughs> benefiting I talked about audacious uh, 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 yeah, entrepreneurs. Here is one. You know, in India, I remember 1976, when Shalya and I went back, it used to take six to seven years to get a telephone back. Mm -hmm. Six to seven years. Just last month, 20 million mobiles have been sold. In one month. India had changed quite dramatically. In year 2000, when the conditions were so bad on telephones, this gentleman comes up, Dhiru Ambani says, uh, India needs phone call at the price of a postcard, and I will deliver it. And he delivered. In year 2000, there were 5 million mobiles in, uh, 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 in India. Uh, last year, 820 million. All right. Real exponential growth, so as to say. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible story. And the net effect of that has been <laughs> the benefit has reached the have-nots, this farm. 
the benefit has reached this vegetable man the benefit has reached uh, uh, this uh, uh, fisher and what difference is it bringing in their lives by the way it's incredible for example this fisherman gets an sms telling him the potential fishing zone where he can get three to four times more fish he goes there catches it his income level is potentially few times higher but had he caught a lot of fish and gone home without any refrigeration facilities would have been lost anyway no not anymore on the mobile he is able to sell it even before he reaches the shops that's the difference that's making what does this uh, uh, vegetable vendor do she does toyota model of inventory control <laughs> she knows exactly the 37 customers what do they want and stores exactly that no losses of any kind and what does this farmer do previously he used to go to all mandis and come back uh, empty handed or selling it at a price that is available no more so he knows in exactly what mandi he can get uh, this price and this is a socio economic transformation not just economic transformation there's a village near pune an ngo came and told me on the other day something very interesting because now in india the handsets are available for 25 dollars phone call per minute is just 1 cent as against 8 cents in america so people can afford it and that village everybody has a mobile the favorite past time in that village used to be that the husband would get drunk in the evening and his favorite past time will be he will come fight with his wife and beat her no more so why because the wives are networked if he comes and has an intention of beating her a message goes and we find this ten women come <laughs> so should us i think in america people may not be able to sort of understand you know what a rule of thumb goes in india but technology is helping and it is helping because it is inclusive technology it is affordable technology it is making a difference to the lives of uh, uh, the uh, the people now if you move forward this basic concept of using frugal engineering basically is spreading now across nano has become an interesting word by the way so any time people do something which is very high performance at low cost it's called nano so there is a nano refrigerator what is the nano refrigerator what is the normal refrigerator 5000 dollars right now this new refrigerator dollar 70 and uh, it is called chotu cool chotu as we know is small and cool is cool all right and a completely different design we call it nano refrigerator creating a completely new refrigeration ca uh, uh, category worth lowest cost as i said and it is co-created by corporate and rural consumers godrej boys created that the engineers actually went and stayed in the villages saw the habits of uh, the women you know the buying habits now they don't go to supermarket and bring a uh, week's grocery or, uh, or or fruits and vegetables to store they do it practically daily basis because they are uh, earning daily wages so as to say so the refrigerator had to be designed for that sort of a uh, uh, loading advanced solid state technology to cool instead of traditional compressors because if you keep the compressor there is no way that you uh, can reach that sort of uh, uh, performance and uh, an unconventional top opening that will ensure that cold air settles down in the cabinet to minimize heat loss and power consumption because every uh, 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 you know gram of cool air or every cc of cool air had to be saved you know when you open the refrigerator door you know how much of uh, cool air goes in and once again you are losing so they had to think of everything and get away uh, from the conventional technology like compressor and so on so forth etc and this chotu cool you can see what difference is going to make in the villages what i have talked to you so far is technological innovation right whether it is nano uh, whether uh, it is uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, and what have you they are all technological <coughs> innovation but it's not necessary that it's only the technological innovation which will make a difference 
there are different types of innovations which can bring inclusion and which can be categorized as inclusive innovation. And let me take you through this. Uh, please, please come here. Please come. Uh, the business process innovation uh, has been so effective in India, and I will give you an instance. For example, when we talk about the telecom revolution, <laughs> And more than 800 million Indian subscribers, both rich and poor, you have 20 million new subscribers added per month. Uh, the lowest cost of a minute of cell phone time being one cent. That is actually a business process innovation. India did not have telecom technology. All right, they were not owners, but the way it was used in order to sort of uh, uh, deliver these uh, numbers uh, was very very interesting. In fact. Airtel is revolutionary in the telecom industry. They have more than 100 million subscribers. They scaled very rapidly in a capital intensive business. And they focused on contribution per minute of time as opposed to average revenue per user. You know this fundamental change. In fact, the story goes that when Dhirubhai Ambani said, phone call at the cost of a postcard, he said that and gave that target to Mukesh Ambani and his uh, uh, other young people. And he said, do it. Now, what they did was that they said that we don't understand telecom, but we do understand refining. Okay. So, when you refine and you create, let's say, petrol or a diesel, and when you buy petrol and diesel, you don't charge on the basis of how much you bought, right? Whether it is you bought uh, 10 liters or 20 liters or 50 liters, right? The unit price is determined on a completely different basis. That is how many barrels per day we were processing. Okay? So they drew the equivalent of that. And what is the equivalent of barrels per day of flow? That is Erlang, which is the volume of uh, uh, traffic of wise that follows per uh, unit time. Okay? And they changed the fundamentals. And they did, of course, several other innovations. And that's exactly what uh, uh, Airtel uh, uh, carried forward. And uh, they moved away from the traditional carrier's approach of vertical integration. They outsourced most of the functions. They enabled focusing on growth without the constraint of capital. So wherever there was an issue of having a capital expenditure, they tried to see how we can convert it into operational expenditure, capex to opex, continuously. And uh, you can see the result. In fact, what they did very carefully, I mean, it's uh, incredible. Because you have to deliver, you know, there are towers, the, that, and the other, I mean, a whole range of things. Uh, they used uh, the conventional FMCG distribution channels, like Hindustan Liba, all right, because they were there in every villages, okay? Because the capital investments were already made in order to create the physical infrastructure, and they used that, all right? The entire story, by the way, has been carried by uh, 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 carried in the paper by me and C.K. Prahlad in the Harvard Business Review by the, of the same title, Innovations Holy Grail, which appeared last year uh, in, in, uh, 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 in July, August. And you might want to have a look at it on how this uh, marvelous uh, 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 innovation, business process innovation was uh, done. Then, of course, there are other ways of doing it. I talked about technological innovation. I talked about business process innovation. Then there is workflow innovation. The best example of that is uh, Arvind IKS cataract eye surgery. How much does it cost in America to do this surgery? $3,000. In India, Arvind IKS does it for $30 to $300. $30 for the poorer people, $300 for those who can afford. And believe me, 30 to 40 percent of the surgeries are free. Absolutely free for the poorest of the poor. And how many do they do it? 300,000. 300,000, you know, per year. So it is a real case of what you might say, more from less for many people. Now, if you look at Arvindai Care, the way they change the workflow innovation, there was a basic belief with them that there are nearly 24 million blind in the world. One third of them are unnecessarily blind. They don't have to be. And they wanted to eradicate unnecessary blindness. That was their mission statement. 
and they created a revenue model where thousands of blind people were treated free and only 30% of the patients will pay, but operating profits will be more than 40%. It was not a philanthropic activity, it was business, by the way, okay? And uh, uh, around 300,000 cataract surgeries uh, per year. How did they do that? They increased the surgeon's productivity, not the number of surgeons. What it means is that they did not have 10 times more surgeons. Each surgeon became 10 times more efficient, so as to say. They used the assembly line technique of surgery, which increased the productivity by a factor of 10. And inspiration from McDonald's they took, by the way, <laughs> delivery of same quality of products in diverse regions through highly trained staff. And the cost of lenses, of course, they brought down to dollar hundred to dollar two. I don't know how many of you have read the, this uh, uh, latest Economist. There are innovation awards that have been given, and one of the innovation awards has gone to Dr. Devi Sethi, who does the heart surgery. <coughs> For what? Ten times lower cost than it is in U.S. Quality, absolutely outstanding. Once again, workflow innovation. So whether it is cataract eye surgery, whether it is this, whether it is supply of an emergency service, for example, which we have covered as a case study in our Harvard Business Review paper, you'll find all these objectives are achievable. Now you would say, come on. Something that is delivered for $3,000, you are delivering for $30 and $300, come on. That means the quality must be awful, right? Not so. Don't forget what I said. Not less from less, more from less. And how is it more from less? I have here a table of the events that occur after the surgery is done. <coughs> Comparison between Royal College of Ophthalmologists and Arvind. Just see the table, the capsule rupture. You can see Arvind is twice as good. 4.4% versus 2%. Iris trauma, Arvind is twice as good. Iris prolapse, Arvind is seven times better. Anterior chamber collapse, Arvind is almost twice as good. Loss of nuclear fragment, Arvind is 50% better, and so on. He's getting more from this, not less from this. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you that I'm not talking about appropriate technology. Because when you talk about appropriate technology, you're talking about less from less, or therefore, give them something which will sort of basically work, no. The same experience of sitting in a car, you get at a fraction of a price, so as to <coughs> not on sitting on a more sophisticated tool. That's the difference. That requires a completely different way of thinking for the designers, the producers, the manufacturers, and so on. And in the health sector, this is happening all the time, for example, India's hepatitis B vaccine, the international price was $18 per dose, and Shanta Biotech came up with 40 cents per dose. And then you would say, oh my God, so cheap, so it must be awful in terms of quality, sorry. 40% of UNICEF supply is from there. Unless the standards were met, they would not have survived this. So it is really getting more from less. Now, if you look at uh, the entire area of therapeutics, we have been <coughs> discussing with uh, uh, Mukund and his team and everyone else on how does uh, one uh, reduce uh, the cost uh, because you have discovery, uh, development, uh, delivery issue in, in developing new drugs. And uh, then you can start thinking in terms of uh, innovation in research process uh, uh, itself. Can you do the research process differently? And yes, uh, we need to do that differently because if you look at what happened 10 years ago and today, what do you find? The cost of development has gone from $250 million to $1 to $1.5 million. You find the time it takes has moved from 10 to 15 years because of the regulator. Uh, uh, you know, he has become very tough. And the potential new drugs, 40 to 30 to 20. So what are we doing now? We are spending more time, we are spending more money and creating less new chemical entities. So it is not getting more from less for more. It is getting less from more for less and less people. Why less and less people? Because if you are spending so much money, 
obviously less and less people will benefit. Oh, come on, how do we change that? That's what inclusive innovation does. It starts uh, looking at uh, alternatives, and here is an interesting challenge, psoriasis. For example, the cost of treatment is $20,000. It's very expensive. I was uh, looking at the American um, Medical uh, Association's advertisement recently saying that psoriasis for your lifetime treatment, will, uh, the cost will be like that of a house, by the way, and so on. So expensive, all right? So $20,000 time for development, 10 years, cost of development, $300 million, like the antibody injection under the skin that uh, uh, was uh, developed by Amgen. Now you start putting, don't forget, we are looking at 4 billion people whose income levels are less than $2 a day. So what can they afford? They can't uh, uh, afford uh, $20,000. Can we do it in $100? Looks ridiculous. But let's put those as targets. Time for development, five years. And uh, cost of development, well, we can afford 10 million. We can't afford. All looks absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Sorry, this has been meant. And how has uh, this been meant? By following a simple principle. <coughs> what did Francis Bacon say? He said, when you wish to achieve results that have not been achieved before, it is an unwise fancy to think that they can be achieved by using methods that have not been used before. Or in other words, if you want to achieve such disruptive results, you can't follow the current practices and tweak them. Because if you tweak them, your performance in terms of meeting the price performance envelope will be just a small tweak. No. Because we are talking about sort of a drastic change. So what are the alternatives? Then one starts thinking about. I talk about two that are being practiced in India. Uh, one is, of course, looking at traditional medicine, modern medicine, and modern science, because traditional medicine is one where uh, uh, basis on the basis of experience, but not scientific or clinical research, uh, people have developed things in what? Not in the laboratories of Harvard or MIT or Caltech, but in the laboratories of life. And they've been using it for centuries. Is it not knowledge? Of course it is knowledge. Has it not worked? Of course it has worked. So why don't we have that knowledge and create, uh, let's say, a golden triangle between modern medicine, modern science, and traditional medicine. What it means is that we have to do things radically differently. We are moving from a molecule to mice to men. Right? You discover a molecule, put it into an animal, uh, looked at uh, toxicology, the rest of it, the safety, and then you move into phase one, phase two, phase three, isn't it? That's the process. Rather than that, we start looking at reverse pharmacology, where men have already used it, okay? Then put it into the mice, and then into the men. Change uh, the entire uh, course uh, uh, of uh, discovery, and this is the kind of breakthrough that you have. For example, meeting the kind of targets that you meet. Uh, there is a huge uh, network program in India. Uh, while I was the director general of CSIR, I promoted that with 19 CSIR institutions, with so many others uh, getting uh, sort of integrated, and there are so many things in the pipeline. This is in phase two clinical trial at the moment. And then my successor, uh, Dr. Samir Brahmachari, an outstanding mind, did this open source drug discovery. I remember. Uh, uh, in 2005, uh, WHO had set up a commission on intellectual property rights, innovation, and public health. Madame Ruth Dreyfus, who was the former president of Switzerland, <coughs> was uh, the chairperson. I happened to be the vice chair. And we worked for two years to see how we can actually make uh, uh, therapeutics, uh, vaccines, etc. Available, affordable, and accessible. It, it took us two years, and that report has been accepted. And one of the suggestions we had made in that report was that uh, we see Linux for, uh, in, in software, open source. Why not open source uh, drug discovery? We had proposed that idea there. But we did not know how to do it, by the way. And the genius of Samir Brahmachari made it possible. So what he has done is that he has taken something very relevant to the poor, which is uh, the understanding of the TB bacteria. And uh, he is using crowdsourcing, and he has been able to, within two years, 
get 130 countries and 4,500 users, basically, with all these partners that you see. And if you see very carefully, you can see uh, the uh, uh, process flow uh, where he uses creatively a whole range of people, including students, young researchers, and so on and so forth. There's a huge community now. And that community is actually driving this process of experience, low cost, globally competitive contract research organizations partnering with them. And if you see, for example, the way the ideas move into projects, the open lab notebook, the data wiki, open bookmarks and ideas, and whole range of people, medicinal chemists, engineering professionals, medical professionals, software professionals, uh, computational biologists, all of them basically working together. I think it's a game changer, if you, if you like. It's, it's, it's a very, very uh, different way of uh, doing things. I've just given you two examples, reverse pharmacology and open source drug discovery. Ten years ago, we didn't talk about them. <coughs> Today, they are in existence. Ten years down the line, I do not know whether they will become standard practices. Can we add to these two 20 other ways of doing things? Entirely possible, if we are serious about it. Just like the lunch on discussion uh, that we had. Uh, I use the word innovation, Indian innovation. And uh, you can see more from less for many, and I've given you many examples like a car which becomes so cheap, cell phone which becomes so cheap, a laptop. There's a $35 laptop now in India, uh, which Kapil Sibyl just uh, launched. Uh, uh, then you have psoriasis treatment, hepatitis B vaccine at a fraction of the cost, cataract surgery at a fraction of the cost, artificial foot at a fraction of the cost. If you exclude laptop and psoriasis treatment, the rest of it has been all practiced and is being used by <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people. But what you find distinctive here, that by following technological innovation, business process innovation, workflow innovation, organizational innovation, and in some cases, even disruptive policy innovation, public policy innovation, you are able to sort of bring these uh, uh, costs down. So it is possible. Now, you might say, well, these are wonderful examples, but come on, uh, how do we institutionalize this, isn't it? All the time, that's the question. Don't impress us by giving some isolated examples. Come on, how do we institutionalize? Well, for that, we have to get into the fundamentals. What do we need for inclusive uh, innovation? I think first, there must be conducive government policies. Very important. Government comes in a big way. Second, there have to be new performance measures for firms. They can't be measured by the standard uh, EBITDA, profit after tax, and uh, uh, you know value to the shareholder and the rest of it. There must be new measures, and there must be MLM mindsets. You know, policymakers, science, technology, invest, uh, innovation community, business sector, citizens, and there must be MLM leaders. At the end of the day, a Ratan Tata says one lakh car. At the end of the day, Adhirubhai Ambani says, uh, phone call at the cost of a postcard. Somebody committed, willing to dive, willing to uh, uh, sort of uh, lead, that's what we need. Also, we have to incentivize the public and private sector to undertake R&D, leading to inclusive innovations. Why should they do that? You know? There must be other policies, like public procurement, guaranteed off-takes, uh, price subsidy, for inclusive innovation products and services, because initially you need that support, otherwise uh, you go out of the window. There must be fiscal incentives for inclusive innovation, and there must be national and global recognition for game-changing inclusive innovation. It's extremely uh, important. And who set it up? Not necessarily the government, individuals can. I'll tell you what I've done. My mother, you know, she uh, actually used to tell me, when you are poor, there is a problem. When you are old, there is a problem. But when you are poor as well as old, there is a big problem. And she used to tell me, do something for them, so as to say. I have created, personally, an award, which is 100,000 rupees per year. Not a lot, but that's what I could afford. It is called Anjani Mashelkar Inclusive Innovation Award. And it will be given from this year onwards, on 17 December, 
Mr. Narayan Murthy, the chief of Infosys, you know, the mentor now, uh, he's going to give it away. And what is the idea? The idea is something that is available and affordable and accessible to the old people who are also poor, we create, you know. Uh, for example, a hearing aid, all right? Not uh, 15,000 rupees, but 500 rupees. Somebody sort of uh, being able to do that. It's an individual effort. There are so many high net worth individuals. Why can't they set up these awards? We should set this up. Because how, and my idea is again, not to give award to a finished product, to give an award to a concept, a breathtaking idea. Because we'll take that and then take it forward by sort of linking them with the, uh, the, the you know, uh, designers, venture capitalists, and so on and so forth. And our idea is to go to the schools, go to engineering colleges, uh, uh, stimulate uh, those 400,000 young engineers who graduate every year by saying this. Not that because they want that one like No. What we want to tell them is that you can add uh, life to their ears when they're continuing to add years to their life, life to their years, if you can do something uh, sort of for that. And we require many, many uh, such uh, efforts. The financing, the vitamin M, as we say, <laughs> is very important. Early stage financing, creating special instruments to provide early stage financing for innovative breakthroughs, promoting diffusion, prototyping, scaling up, wide scale deployment of proven technologies, uh, belonging to the inclusive innovation class and setting ambitious targets in diverse areas and inviting competitive bids from across the nation. It can deliver the results by the way. So let me tell you a story. Year 2000, on around, I think it was 17 February, I got a call from Mr. Yashun Sina, who was then the finance minister. And he said, uh, Mashalgar, uh, uh, I'm going to announce my uh, our budget on 28 February. So let us announce something exciting, which will which will challenge the scientific community and so on. So I said, then, sir, how much time do I have? And he said, 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> In Delhi, if you get 30 minutes, that's a lot. Yeah. And I remember uh, pressing the bell and calling my stenographer and dictating what we call a new millennium Indian Technology Leadership Initiative, Nimitri. What did I say in that note that I finally prepared? I said in the entire 20th century, India has not produced something which is first to the world. We must create something which is first to the world. Now how do you create first to the world? By becoming a leader. And when you become a leader, you want to become a leader. You are not following, you are not copying, you are not doing reverse engineering. You are bound to fail. And that risk the government should take. And I said, let there be a public-private partnership with the private sector getting loan, which is zero percent interest, to be paid <coughs> only if you succeed. But coupled with public sector institutions, which can be knowledge partners, which will get grant. So it was a grant and loan combination. After an hour, I got a call from the finance minister's office, uh, his secretary, saying, FM loves it. How much? Now, very frankly, I had not thought of how much, but I looked at Technology Development Board, which was playing safe, and it was some $10 million. I said, why not $10 million for gambling? I said $10 million, and that was done, and then I wrote a little note, basically, uh, six lines, which he read out in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the parliament, in his speech. Interestingly, the Minister of Science and Technology did not know about this. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, planning commission who read the check finally did not know about it. <laughs> it was a deal between me and the finance minister. So as to say. When we launched the Nimitli, I created 10,000 such pamphlets, by the way. You can't read them. And sent it across for July 2000. And there were many targets that were set in terms of what we want to achieve. One of them wasn't tuberculosis, by the way. You know, because tuberculosis gets cleared in six to eight months, and that's too long for poor people. Because, you know, uh, within one or two months, they feel better, then they stop taking medicines. Because their weight is regained, their appetite is regained, and that is why you get uh, disease-resistant uh, 
tubic losses, you see. <coughs> so we said, can you reduce it to sort of two months? That was, that was given as a target. And I'm very happy to say that discovery of a new drug molecule first in the last 40 years, it came after reform after 1963. Reducing the treatment from six to eight months to two months, it's in phase two clinical trials. But some very unconventional uh, thinking. I think the main point I want to make, and there were so many others, by the way, by the time I left in 2006, there were more than 100 private sector companies, 250 institutions working on such grand challenges, which were actually based on inclusive innovation. The government just putting no more than $10 million, by the way. Of course, $10 million goes a long way in India. You have to multiply it by a certain factor to understand what it will sort of basically cost you. But that's what I mean by grand challenges. You know, you give such grand challenges, and people come out with these solutions. I think we need to change the model. The old model was doing well and doing good. What did doing well mean? From an industrial enterprise, make a lot of profit, a lot of value to the shareholder. And then you say part of that profit I will keep as a, uh, as for my social corporate responsibility, if you like, SCR, or I will create a foundation, or I will create a trust. And through that, I will do the good. So there was a doing well and doing good. The new paradigm has to change to doing well by doing good. What does it mean? When these low cost mobile phones are produced, one same per eight minute, such a low, uh, per, per minute, such a low cost, you saw the benefits that are coming. But at the same time, Airtel's profits are billions of dollars. All right, no issue on that but they're doing well by doing good. Can we now create enterprises who believe in this? Not for free, for profit, but at the same time, creating equity. Uh, businesses of the future, therefore, I firmly believe, uh, will be very different in terms of thinking. The traditional firms think that we cannot change our cost structure. All right, take it or leave it. <coughs> Whatever those customers who can uh, afford it, we'll take it. Sorry. The inclusive innovation firms will have to say, what if we change the way we operate? Right? The conventional firms feel there's no price elasticity. The inclusive innovation firms believe that there is a price elasticity. Traditional firms think if we reduce the price, the market is unlikely to grow dramatically. The inclusive innovation firms will say, make it affordable to the poor, and there will be explosive growth. Focus on volume, low cost, low capital intensity. All right, that's how 800 million mobiles. Get the point. And then, of course, traditional firms always feel there's no mass market for high-tech products. The poor have no use for them. We always believe high technology cannot be meant to work for the poor. Sorry. There is a market for high-tech products among the poor. They will pay for it and adapt it rapidly. I think that's the fundamental change in the mindset. <coughs> Therefore, we will require business leaders who will also think differently to lead such businesses. They have to set ambitious goals and clear direction. They have to invent next practices, not just best practices. Because if they follow best practices, where would they end up with? They have to really take steps into the next practice. They have to use strategy as a stretch. They have to continuously ask, what is my man on the moon project? Or like in Indian boardrooms, they ask nowadays, what is my nano project? <laughs> so as to say, all right? That language has to change. Language in inclusive organizations have to change. Suppliers as partners. They have to say employees as innovators, customers as people. That's exactly what happened in the case of nano, by the way the suppliers, the vendors, everybody joined in in order to sort of contribute by way of uh, uh, ideas. We have captured all this in this paper, Innovations Holy Grail, by me and C.K. Prahlad. Unfortunately, it turned out to be C.K.'s last paper. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. I mean, I still can't believe a word without uh, C.K., honestly. And the entire world is now taking notice. You must have seen this economist, yeah. the world turned upside down. A special report on innovation in emerging markets, uh, uh, which appeared last year. And this paper in Harvard Business Review, yeah. how G is disrupting itself by Jeffrey Mel, 
uh, what says for decades, G has sold modified Western products to emerging markets. Now to preempt the emerging giants, it is trying to reverse, and they call it reverse innovation. So what's the story? The story is a simple one. G Medical in India designed and developed an ECG machine uh, which uh, had a fraction of a cost. Okay? But the quality, just perfect. Now you can imagine an ECG machine, you know, I mean, those blips, you can't make mistakes. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll sort of misinterpret. So you, you don't have a chance for any direction, even one person direction, call it. But it was a fraction of the cost. And what they found was that it was finding markets in Europe, US, and so on. China developed uh, uh, the same G Medical, developed uh, ultrasound, portable ultrasound, fraction of a cost, same quality. So the thesis that they have now, previously, the Western world would create, let's say, uh, a very sophisticated product with number of functionalities and so on. Then look at the developing world and say, oh, well, what can they afford? They can't afford this. Take it out. Oh, they can't afford this and so on. And then send the product. Right? It's almost like creating Mercedes and then making Mercedes minus and selling it. Now, what they are saying is that it will be a nano that will be created and nano plus will be sold. So as to say. It's a complete sort of turnaround. And partly that turnaround is coming because emerging economies like China and India, for example, uh, the GDP per capita is increasing. They are not, uh, they, they will not, I mean, Currently, India still is uh, in this form, uh, a pyramid, but they will become diamonds. You get my point, with a very large <coughs> fraction of low and middle class uh, sort of people who can afford those products, but at the same time, they have aspirations. Because they are not super rich, but they have aspirations to get quality. And therefore, the driver would be one where you will start creating such uh, products, and the numbers are very large. You are looking at 1 billion middle class to 2 billion middle class to 3 billion middle class and so on and so forth. I was talking to, uh, in a party, uh, the Siemens uh, uh, managing director in India and he told me that they are creating an X-ray machine which is ultra low cost basically for these markets, those billions of markets. And he said we are doing it in India. And I said why in India? He said look, in Germany uh, they can't think about uh, uh, this uh, frugal engineering, the way it comes naturally uh, to Indians. So this is getting evolved into a sort of a paradigm shift. And this word, more from less for more, is, uh, or many, is uh, becoming a buzzword, MLM. The World Economic Forum had a session on MLM. And MLM is moving forward as the new message for the 21st century. And remember, MLM has to be interpreted in a slightly different way too. When you say more people, it's not just the current people, the future people, your great-grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. That means we are talking about planet. So it is people, planet, and profit going together. That is MLM, basically. And that is becoming uh, the message. I mean, if you see the evolution of moments, you had Kanban just in time, uh, Kaizen, continuous improvement, ISO, the process standardization, Six Sigma, zero defects. Maybe the next moment is MLM. More from less food. Thank you. You know, a clap or a smile doesn't cost anything. <laughs> <laughs> so MLM is uh, creating a new vocabulary. Reverse innovation is what you heard, basically. Frugal engineering is what you have heard. I called it Gandhian engineering, by the way. Four years ago, an Australian academy had honored me, uh, like I got honored recently in, in, in uh, uh, the American Academy. And uh, they invited me to talk about uh, uh, innovation. And I was the first Indian that they had honored. So I thought they don't know enough about India, otherwise there are 100 people who are better than me <laughs> that they should honor. So I titled it as uh, uh, Indian Innovation from Gandhi to Gandhian Engineering. And why Gandhian Engineering? Because Gandhi had said two things that were very important. One was that he said, I value 
the science that delivers to the poor on one hand. And he had also said that uh, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Right? Or in other words, he was talking about getting more from less for more and more people, MLM. So that Gandhi engineering word had become sort of uh, uh, quite popular. And of course, innovation, we from India believe that uh, we are quite uh, sort of good at that. I uh, want to end by saying, uh, I mean, uh, repeating what I had said in my GRD Tata Corporate Leadership Lecture in 1998. I'd said then, and this is my new book, by the way, Reinventing India, uh, where this has been published uh, this particular lecture. I'd said, finally, 1999 should be the year where we should launch a powerful national innovation movement to propel us into the next millennium. The I in India should not stand for imitation and inhibition. It must stand for innovation. The I in IIT must stand for innovation. The I in industry, the I in CSI must stand for innovation. The I in every individual <coughs> Indian must stand for innovation. It is only this innovative India that will signal to the rest of the world that we are not a hesitant nation, unsure of our place in the new global order, but a confident one that is raring to go and be a leader in the committee of nations. Now, this was 10 years ago. This was 10 years ago. And it took uh, the Indian government 10 years. Uh, 4 June 2009. <laughs> <laughs> I said 1999. 4 June 2009. Uh, our president said next 10 years will be dedicated in India as a decade of innovation. And uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh formally declared the decade of 2010 20 as the Indian decade of innovation. <laughs> now, there's a lot of excitement in India about this now. Under Sam Pitoda, Prime Minister's Innovation Council has been created. I happen to be a member of that. And one of the big agenda that we are driving is inclusive innovation. Because that is where India can distinguish itself. And if India does well in inclusive innovation, it will benefit the whole world. Don't forget that in South Africa, when the HIV AIDS treatment, ARV cocktail, was being offered for $10,000 for a year, it was Sipla who brought it down to $350. Thanks to the work that was done in the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology by Dr. Gurjan, $10,000. It was a game changer, so as to say. India made that difference. And then, of course, uh, uh, came Doha, and uh, you know the rest of the story. I don't want to uh, get into that. Because India had that inherent capacity to do that. India has to worry about that bottom of the pyramid, okay? Inclusive education, inclusive health are a must, basically. Access to education, to teeming millions. You must have seen, uh, you know, young children from shanty towns and <coughs> the urban poor, etc. Et you know, frankly, I would not be standing here, but for inclusive education. I was given access to education. You know, I came from very poor conditions. Uh, I was about to leave my school, basically. And I remember SSC, Secondary School Certificate Exam, 1960. I stood 11th among 135,000 students. But my poor widowed mother couldn't afford my education, so I was about to leave it. And you know what happened? Sardorap Tata Trust came and gave me 60 rupees per month for six years. That's how I could study. That's why I'm here. 60 rupees per month, which is a dollar per month. Tatas did not even realize that they had lost a dollar per month. But it made such a difference to my life. That was inclusive innovation. I mean, inclusive education. It's paradoxical <coughs> that just uh, on the 1st of October, the American Academy of Arts and Science honored uh, two Indians with foreign fellowship. After 1780, by the way, there have been only six Indians we have got honored. One was Ratan Tata, and one was myself. And we signed in the book on the same page. That same family. That same family which gave me access to education. It's, it's paradoxical that uh, we should have been signing in the same book at the same time. That's what access does to you. 
that's what that young man that you saw who runs that kilometer in 4 minute 30 second beating all of you that makes it possible all right and therefore inclusive innovation more from this for more has to be the world it will create equity it will create reduce the inequalities the inequities and will create a better world all the current problems of the world are because of that. we therefore uh we want to use this decade of innovation for uh, setting up lots of initiatives in inclusive uh, uh, innovation uh, i'm very grateful to you that you gave me an opportunity uh, to speak about something that's not only very close to my heart which i firmly believe is the solution for creating a better world thank you Yeah, we'll we'll give him a chance to yeah, get a sip of water and have some questions.